join thousands of NFT traders who already start their day on Crypto Slam. While many traditional financial institutions were turning their backs on blockchain, Singapore's DBS opened the door. One of the things that we look forward that we are convinced about is the power of distributed ledger technology and uh, blockchain. I think the technology is quite clearly going to um, make fundamental change to the back office of the world. And what about the complicated relationship between central bankers and cryptocurrencies? I think there's a serious concern with regulators that crypto can be used for illegal purposes. Where are we in the crypto life cycle? And how exactly will blockchain technology change the way money moves? Coming up on Word on the Block, on location in Singapore. Piyush Gupta, CEO of DBS Bank, joins in to dive deep into those topics and a whole lot more. Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and all the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Today, we are in conversation with Piyush Gupta, CEO of DBS Bank, one of the biggest and largest legacy banks in Southeast Asia. Thank you so much for welcoming us to your beautiful offices here in Singapore. It's great to be here and to be sitting down with you for Word on the Block. It's, it's a real pleasure. No, I'm very happy to uh, chat with you about this. It's a great subject and, uh, you know, it is topical today. It's topical today. And you've also been at the forefront of something that's been topical for maybe not a lot of institutions, but for certainly a lot of innovators and game changers and disruptors in this space. But watching DBS very closely, this is one of the biggest legacy institutions in Southeast Asia today. Uh, and so to see a traditional bank, a behemoth, to get into really a disruptive space of blockchain, of crypto, uh, why did you do it? So first, Angie, let me start by correcting. You keep uh, calling us a legacy institution. I think for the last seven years, we've transformed uh, quite substantively uh, into being a very digital kind of bank. We were rated one of the most, 10 most transformative organizations of the last decade. Uh, and so our roots in the last five, seven years have not really been legacy. We have digitized our operations. We are actively using artificial intelligence and machine learning. We are actively using ecosystem strategies. So the nature of the bank has evolved quite considerably. Uh, one of the things as we look forward that we are convinced about is the power of distributed ledger technology and uh, blockchain. I think the technology is quite clearly going to um, make fundamental change to the back office of the world. So the you know, hub and spoke arrangements will get replaced by participative distributive arrangements. And depending on how much of an evangelist you are, you can work your way into nine billion self-sovereign entities and a completely decentralized finance world or you can fall short of that. Uh, but irrespective of where you are on the spectrum, uh, there is no question that the technology will let you reimagine the way things are done. Now, when you accept that the technology is powerful and is driving change in the way things happen, then it starts linking to uh, really important areas in banking which can change substantively. One of that uh, is clearing and settlement systems. You know, the whole clearing and settlement architecture of the world is based on a hub and spoke arrangement. You go through SWIFT networks, you go through correspondent banks, you have T plus two settlement. Uh, if you convert that into a blockchain based arrangement, uh, then you can get T plus zero settlement and you can go point to point without hub and spoke. So I do think you'll find changes in uh, settlement systems as an example. You will also find changes in cross asset class settlements. So, you know, uh, uh, FX settlement, currency versus DVD, DVP payment, et cetera, settlements. I think a lot of that will happen. But one of the things that I think will also happen is a change in the nature of money. And the reason it will happen is because history tells you that the nature of money always follows technology. So money used to be cowrie shells and then money went on to become metal and silver and gold and then it became paper and then 70 years ago it became plastic and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, money even uh, today, 97%, 98% of money is bits and bytes, it's digital. You know, that's what money is. It's, 
it's secondary creation by banking systems and it travels over wires, right? Mm -hmm. But as technology continues to evolve, and so people in the mobile phone gets more ubiquitous, and things like QR code, et cetera, become more prevalent, uh, it stands to reason that the nature of money in day-to-day -day use will also continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes quite compelling for a bank, certainly with a bank with our DNA today, uh, to start participating and thinking about this future. You know, so how yeah. can you actually play a role in shaping that future, or at least being a part of that future? So long answer to your question of why we're in this, because we just think that's the way the world is going. Well, you know, to be quite frank, this doesn't sound like it comes from uh, the CEO of, for a lot of people, still very much a traditional bank, S something that has existed for a very long time. You sound very much in the same kind of kindred spirit of a lot of the innovators and OGs in blockchain and crypto space that really regard money differently. Um, a lot of your peers and colleagues still in the space wouldn't agree with you and would say that, in fact, what is the underlying value of crypto? What is the underlying value of digital assets? Um, if you think about money in this classic sense as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value, I think that there's some forms uh, of money, principally state bank money, uh, public money, which will serve uh, all three functions. It will be a medium exchange and a unit of account in addition to store of value. So basically CBDCs and potentially stable coins, but I think mostly CBDCs. Um, within that realm, while they serve all three purposes, you then start wondering uh, what incremental efficiency or effectiveness do they build, bring in the retail space relative to what you have today and what incremental efficiency or effectiveness they can bring in the wholesale space. Um, I'm of the view that in the retail space, for most developed countries of the really efficient uh, monetary system, the net incremental value is actually marginal. And therefore, a uh, lot of central banks are exploring retail CBDCs, but it's not entirely clear to me uh, that they're going to go down that path. Uh, because today, you, like I said, most people are getting out of paper money anyway. Mm -hmm. You can use plastic, you can use, you know, I have something called Pela. Most banks have their own QR code-based system. If this already exists in the private sector, then the incremental value of the public sector producing an alternative to that becomes more questionable. One of the risks of uh, retail CBDC, which is why central banks are a little thoughtful about it, uh, is it could disintermediate the existing banking system. And again, you could argue, a DeFi uh, evangelist would argue you don't need the banking system. Uh, I think central banks are still concerned about the, uh, the construct of credit creation. Um, and if you don't have an existing banking system, credit creation either gets left to individuals in a P2P domain, or it falls on the shoulders of central banks. Most central banks don't want to take that burden. And therefore, it seems to me that a completely disintermediated retail CBDC, most central banks will not espouse. Uh, then an intermediated CBDC, so like the Chinese are doing, you know, so you go through a banking system, could happen, but again, you know, the Central Bank and um, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Ravi Menon said once, the actual incremental marginal value of doing that relative to what exists today is not clear. So I think many people will watch. So you take the other folk, and the other folk is wholesale CBDCs. Mm. I think wholesale CBDCs really have value. Potentially. And the value comes from the capacity to be able to change the settlement uh, system mm -hmm. around the world, mm -hmm. right? Separately, when you think about, you know, cryptos, it gets into the realm not of public money, but private money. Mm -hmm. My own view is that private money is very hard to uh, use as real money. The history of mankind has shown that private money generally tends to come uh, cropper along the way. Uh, and therefore, for private money to serve those two purposes, medium of exchange, unit of account, tends to be quite difficult. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Even though Elon Musk said he'd you know, accept payment for Teslas and this, he changed his mind a week later. Uh, the you know, reason for that is you don't have stability in values and you don't have ubiquity and fractionalization of that money. So not easy to make that happen. However, I think private money or private crypto as a store of value, I think they're here to stay. You know, uh, six months ago, there were $3 trillion of cryptos in the world. Now, that's $3 trillion store of value already. It's uh, about a $1 trillion today. It's obviously got sold off a lot. Uh, but nevertheless, as a quasi-replacement for gold or any other store of value, uh, I do think they will be around. 
uh, I don't think they're disappearing uh, anytime soon. And a lot of people are speculating that potentially this is the next wave of crypto winter and winter is coming and perhaps winter is already here. In your point of view, does this change the trajectory for your strategy? Well, you know, what we're doing is uh, being quite uh, thoughtful about how we play in the game, right? Mm -hmm. So what we launched um, last year was a digital asset ecosystem, and it had three components to it. Uh, one was the capacity to tokenize uh, and list uh, any asset. Um, so the tokenize, I'm, I'm convinced that eventually all assets will tokenize. Uh, it has to be. The technology lets you do it. It lets you fractionalize it. And if you have a tokenized, fractionalized asset, you can create a lot more liquidity than you can with assets in their current form. Uh, that tokenization and listing capability, we have so far done for a fixed income issue. Uh, we're going to do it for a property transaction later this year. Um, and increasingly, we are looking to be able to tokenize all kinds of different asset classes. The sell-off in the crypto market, I don't think will change that. I think this concept of tokenizing of assets, listing them, trading them, finding price, uh, I think that will definitely continue. Uh, the regulatory framework around that continues to evolve. So if you're a securities token, it's a heavier burden. If you're a non-securities token, it's a lighter burden. The second thing that we set up last year as part of the system was a crypto exchange. And to start with, we're only trading cryptocurrency, um, uh, four currencies, four fiat's, uh, uh, 16 pairs. Uh, but eventually, all of these assets we tokenize, we expect to trade them on the exchange. And, um, I'll come back to that because yeah. there we're being a little bit thoughtful about uh, what we use it for and how fast we go. I want you to hold on to that thought because when we come back, we're going to dig deeper into that crypto exchange, the tokenization of assets, and where DBS views the crypto industry as going and how regulators and regulations play a big part in that when we come back. On the other side, why is Singapore hesitant to give out crypto exchange licenses? We want to be a hub for um, blockchain for sure. Uh, Singapore at the same time is quite conscious of the other part of the spectrum, the suitability agenda, and Singapore is always very careful about putting the you know, man on the street at risk. And later, how will NFTs change in the next few years when word on the block returns? Well, we are back with CEO of DBS, Piyush Gupta, on all things crypto. We heard about your views on how you see this as not only an asset class, but really a technology of the future, and really banking uh, on the future of innovation uh, when it comes to changing uh, the trajectory of this bank. How do regulators play a part in it. And specifically, you know, earlier this year you had shared that you were going to open up the crypto exchange to retail investors. And then Singapore regulators came down and said that they really discouraged uh, selling assets of the crypto nature of digital assets to a retail market. And then the plans changed for DBS. How do you view that change that discussion and the role of the regulator? So I guess let me deal with it in two parts. First is, you know, what are regulators uh, concerned about? Um, and there are really two big uh, agendas. Um, one is the AML KYC agenda. I think there's a serious concern with regulators that crypto can be used for illegal purposes. Uh, you don't get line of sight, people shift money around. Um, in some of the countries in the region, India is a great case in point, uh, the governor of the RBI has been very vocal about the fact that these cryptos are, used, are being used to get outside of the ambit and the supervision of the authorities. There are 100 million crypto users in India. It's the largest um, uh, number of users anywhere in the world, and they're seriously concerned that you know, money moves around, terrorist financing, etc. Do you think that's a fair concern? I think that's a fair concern because uh, when you do, uh, you know, uh, uh, coin purity checks, 
it's quite clear that uh, there is a large element of tainted coins in the system. So yes, I, I think it's appropriate for regulators to be concerned about it and to want to make sure that they have the, the kinds of controls they need to make sure they understand provenance, they understand ownership, and they understand where the money is coming from and going to. Uh, in Singapore, there's something called the travel rule. In fact, it's a global yes. uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to say where does the money come from, where is the money going to. And uh, you know, one of the appeals of crypto and blockchain has been the fact that you can make it less transparent. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what regulators worry about. So I think uh, there is a point of tension there and it's legitimate. The big, second big question regulators have is suitability, uh, which is because a large part of the store of value we were talking about before is not based on fundamentals, it is based on supply and demand. It's based on a notion of value that comes from common belief and a secondary market, but not fundamentals. Therefore... Um, but it depends on what you're talking about, Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of these utility protocols there's an argument to be made that there is a utility fundamental that backs the value of these coins or these cryptos. Well, you could in some case, but you got to go back and say, what is the utility fundamental and link it to value? The vast amount of the cryptos in the world today are really based on, uh, quote unquote, a belief that there is value and a secondary market. By the way, it's not wrong. It's like gold. I mean, why is gold valuable? Right. Because uh, we said it was. We said it was. Yeah. And it's just a you know, yellow colored metal and it's not even the most rare metal in the world. It's not the most useful metal in the world. We collectively buy into the story. So you could argue that there's no reason for a Bitcoin not to be valuable in the same con con context. So the second concern the regulators have is uh, essentially therefore around this. When the young kids, the novices start getting into this as an asset class uh, without understanding that the asset class can be very, very volatile. We've seen that. Uh, then they get hurt. And when they get hurt, then no matter uh, how objective you want to be, governments get involved, politicians get involved, and regulators get involved uh, as part of the duty to safeguard the small investors. So that's the second big concern, uh, KYC, AML, and then suitability. The irony there is that the technology itself can be self-policing in terms of smart contracts. This could actually be baked into and programmed into uh, a, a lot of these transactions and regulators trying to create these guardrails uh, agnostically and and you know manually potentially are missing a, a huge instrument if they understood the technology itself. Well it can and it cannot. Terra and Luna has collapsed. Their weaknesses in the system you know you can short sell Terra and Luna exactly as you can short sell any other currency. If you had retail investors sitting on this relying on the technology today uh, what would you go and say to them? That, well, the technology was great, but something went wrong. And I think as responsible regulators, they're quite mindful of that. So I understand where regulators are coming from. Now, to my mind, like I said, I think technology is here to stay. I think the trains left the station. So the right answer is not to try and regulate it away, mm -hmm. but to regulate it so that you can get into it in a way that you can uh, put OB markers and uh, acceptable boundaries, given the two concerns that the regulators have. I think that the growth of this industry actually does depend on stability and market confidence and therefore regulators actually play a huge part in helping really seed the next phase of growth for the blockchain industry and Web3. The difference is how are those conversations being had right now? So curious, you know, you're really leading the charge putting a lot of capital, putting a lot of strategy into this play. How often do you do you talk to you know, your cohorts uh, in the uh, governmental agencies and the regulators who are very much uh, you know, a big part of your business? Sanjay, we talk to them uh, quite frequently, but uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, there is no common view among regulators. Uh, you have regulators who would essentially say, look, this is too dangerous, just regulate it out of the formal banking sector entirely and let somebody else deal with it. Um, you have other regulators who would say, this technology is here, we should use it and use it in a pragmatic way and see how we can actually work to uh, put the right safeguards in place while you do that. I was uh, interestingly on a call with several central bank governors uh, you know, a few weeks ago and it was quite interesting how the range of opinions uh, uh, manifested itself 
uh, from different central bank governors. So there's no one size fits all, what, even in their own thinking. What right? would you say the spectrum is on the far end? Well, on the one end is just regulate it. And when you raise the, you know, as, as banks, most of the banks would say, if you regulate it, you don't make the industry disappear. You don't make the parsimony disappear. You just squeeze it out of the formal system into the informal system. Mm -hmm. right? But there are, there are regulators who would say, we're quite happy with that. We just regulate the formal system and make sure the formal system doesn't get into this. Right? I kind of think crypto is like water. It will always find a way. Uh, and in the early stages of the development of the space, there was a lot of jurisdiction shopping, as it were. Increasingly, now that the jurisdictions are also doing their own shopping by creating either sandboxes or regulatory environments that help build and nurture how do you see Singapore fitting in? I think Singapore is uh, right in the center. If you read the pronouncements of the government as well as the regulator, uh, they've been pragmatic. They want to be a hub for um, blockchain for sure. Uh, they want to be a hub for uh, uh, central bank digital currency thinking, particularly in the wholesale side. They've experimented a lot with other forms of um, uh, retail, though they've said they're going to watch it. They're not going to lead with that. Uh, but they're leading a lot of the stuff on wholesale, CBDC, settlement engines, etc. Uh, so they clearly want to be there. But uh, Singapore, at the same time, is quite conscious of the other part of the spectrum, the suitability agenda. I and mean, Singapore is always very careful about putting the you know, man on the street at risk and about the AML KYC agenda. And therefore, if you look at the pronouncements, they talk on both sides um, uh, of the camp. They want to be a big center, but they want to do it in a controlled way. Now, what that means, therefore, is that they have a licensing regime. So the Payment Services Act in Singapore uh, is what governs any crypto exchange. They've given out five licenses. They've got five licenses, which they're pending, so about 10, 12 licenses. They have another 60, 70 pending for review. But they're quite thoughtful about how they actually give licenses out and who then how they propose to regulate these players. This doesn't suit some uh, people. So some people choose to move from here and say, you know, they're going to go off to the Middle East or go off to, you know, now increasingly France and so on. Uh, but there are a lot of other people who are happy with this because they figure what you said, that a regulated environment will create trust and confidence in the industry and the system. And I think from the MES standpoint, they're quite happy to deal with the kind of people who think that a regulated environment and putting the safeguards is the right way to go. Well, next up, we're going to find out where you think the right way to go is for crypto and where we are in the life cycle of Web3 when we come back. After the break, could smart contracts do away with the need for central banks and governments? More when we come back. If you don't understand the future, you'll never see your place in it. Introducing Forecast Plus, covering all things blockchain, independent reporting, insights, and access from Asia to the world. We cut through the noise where technology, insights, and access meet, where smart conversations happen. Make friends with disruption. Forecast Plus. Well, welcome back to Word on the Block in conversation with Piyush Gupta. And, oh my gosh, I think we've talked, pretty much covered all the bases. And speaking of bases, where do you think the crypto life cycle is? Where are we in terms of the game? Uh, we're in ground zero in a 10-point <laughs> game of first this thing. This is a long way to go. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm convinced that the world will tokenize. I think uh, digital currencies are here to say, digital settlement mechanisms are here to stay. Actually, I think uh, NFTs are here to stay. So, um, but I do think that they will evolve. Like, you know, several other technologies, they don't happen overnight. And therefore, market confidence, liquidity, regulatory frameworks, all have to come into place. Um, I think one of the big tensions you will see as uh, what you suggested uh, earlier, do you go into a completely unregulated world where smart contracts run the world, or do you still have the framework of institutional arrangements to help run the world? Uh, my view is while the technology might permit smart contracts to run the world, a society as a whole is not ready for that. I guess the nine billion individuals are dealing with each other without governments, without nations, without central banks, without institutions. But that's also that evolving happening. with technology. You have DAOs, you have consensus mechanisms. You, I mean, crypto itself is based on the idea that 
you can democratize with technology and make it immutable. I don't need to know who you are to trust you, though I do, but I also don't need to. Yes. And that is a trustless trans transaction that's actually very valuable. Well, that's, that's exactly the question. And so the question is, does the technology overpower the nature of the world today? Yeah. And you don't have countries anymore. People don't have governments anymore because everybody relies on the technology and the smart contract. And my view is that's not happening. Mm. I do think the technology is still very powerful. It does have the potential to change, like I said, back offices, settlement systems, nature of money. And you're doing so, that yourself at DBS. And so I think all people who take that view, that there is an intermediate position which can change the way things happen today, but without getting to the stage where you're completely self-sovereign, trustless, and without institutional arrangements, I think that's what's going to happen over the next 10, 15 years. And that's the game that we are trying to play. I want to know how you're using the technology right now, even as you change infrastructure and as you view global settlements around the world. So uh, I completely agree with Angie. I think that is the power. And you know, I could be wrong. Maybe 15 years from now, the technology overpowers society. Mm -hmm. I think there's some way to go. But if you assume I'm right, that there is this intermediate role for the technology to empower the current uh, institutional arrangements. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to solve for. So let me give you a, a, an example. Between JP Morgan, ourselves, and Temasek, uh, we've launched a company called Partior. It's a blockchain-based company. And our agenda is to see how we can actually try to rationalize the settlement process, the cross-currency global settlement process. Uh, we will eventually try to see if we can do a DVP, CVP, et cetera, for multiple asset classes. Um, this company has now um, uh, got interest from 40 other financial institutions around the world. Uh, we're trying to set up an arrangement where you have a central, at least one or two players, who do a fear to digital currency switch. And we've got arrangements now for yen, for euro, for sterling, for renminbi, for most of the majors. Uh, and with the intent that we will use the digital currency approach to settle in T plus zero. We hope to be able to, we've done some pilot transactions. We hope to be able to actually create this network of players and uh, launch something more commercial in the second half of the year. Now, that's a great example where we're not trying to you know, change the nature of money itself, but, but we are trying to evolve the nature of the settlement system yeah. to leverage the power of the technology. Yeah, that's and that, that in of itself can be more valuable than anything else is the actual application of that technology. And we do something here called forecast, forecast for certain guests, and you're certainly in that ilk. And this is where we ask you to glare into your own personal crystal ball and tell us uh, one of your predictions for crypto uh, and this technology uh, from your very specific point of view in the next few years. Well, one of the things that I think will happen is um, the continued evolution of uh, non-fungible tokens, the NFTs. Uh, if you take a look at the gaming universe today, right, the three billion gamers, virtual gamers, only two billion people who play physical sport. And the amount of money today, which is uh, spent on the virtual games is massive. Fortnite last year, I think I read somewhere, there's $5 billion spent on buying tokens in Fortnite, both utility tokens and vanity tokens. I think increasingly many of these tokens instead of being in-game, in-app, uh, will start evolving to uh, NFT kind of regime. And then once you have the NFTs, well, you know, Axie Infinity and SLPs over here. Um, so GameFi, the use of NFTs in these uh, contexts will start exploding. But I think also all forms of other things, loyalty, um, you know, airline miles, loyalty programs, I think a lot of these will start evolving to an NFT construct. And once you have NFTs and you can start creating fungibility across NFTs, you have a completely different regime. It's not even crypto. It needs to convert to crypto. But it is another form of digital value. I do think you'll start seeing a lot more of that over the next few years. Well, I know that banks are in the business of money. But I think if money is value, then we are both in the business of value creation. And thank you so much for helping us understand a little bit more about how you value this space and how you see this technology going. Really well, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Enjoyed the conversation. Like I said, I think we are just at the start of what is going to be a very exciting future. And we can't wait. Piyush Gupta, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time.